Good afternoon, St. Margaret Mary. Father Henry here on this Monday of the fifth week of Lent. As we start gearing up to enter Holy Week, I wanted to offer a little reflection, if you will, on some ways to really engage the mysteries of Holy Week, it, since this Holy Week will be so different, will be participated in from a distance, if you will, from from your home, what are some ways then that we can really engage in a meditative way some of the profound mysteries that we commemorate and celebrate during Holy Week? Now, I don't really have a recipe for perfect meditation, if you will, but mostly I want to reflect on some guidelines and suggestions for meditation, for trying to enter into the gospel stories that we will be hearing, especially the accounts of the Lord's passion and resurrection. The first thing I want to mention is two errors, if you will, two boundaries that we don't want to, uh, two traps rather, that we don't want to fall into when we're meditating, especially with scripture. And the first is a tendency to fail to give proper emphasis to Jesus's humanity. You know, I think a lot of times we tend to approach meditation sort of like we might approach looking at a lovely stained glass window of Jesus. Well, the stained glass window may be pretty and may be beautiful, but the image that it depicts of Jesus is still maybe cold may be uh, unmoving without passion or feeling. Stained glass windows do a great job, especially kind of old-fashioned traditional stained glass windows, do a great job of drawing attention to our Lord's divinity. But aside from depicting him in human form, they can make it difficult for us to really engage his humanity. Um... We tend to, I think, when we read the gospel stories, we really see the humanness of the sinners. We really see the humanness of Herod, of Pilate, of the crowds. And Jesus is almost like this ephemeral figure who sort of flits in and out of these passages in a sort of otherworldly way. And while obviously we don't want to neglect our Lord's divinity at all in our meditation, I do think that when we fail to give do justice to his humanity, it makes it challenging to see Christ in my daily experiences. It makes it difficult to see how the Christ who lived and breathed and walked the earth is still able to draw very, very close to me. So, on the other hand, we... This is part of the reason why it's really important then to reflect specifically on our Lord's humanity, to ask, because we ask ourselves the question, will Christ come with me? That's often one of our questions, even if it's unspoken. Will the Christ of the Gospels, our Lord, who suffered, died, and was raised again, will he come with me where I'm walking and going and living? And of course, the letter to the Hebrews tells us that yes, he will, because he's become like us in all things except sin. Therefore, we should approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now, there is the possibility of the opposite error, which is to treat Jesus too much like a friend, too much like a brother, that our meditation sort of sinks into a sentimental worldliness, and it fails to see the Lord as divine as one worthy of our adoration, as one who's able to make certain claims on our life, to, to call us to task and summon us out of the shadows into the fullness of life. So we have to navigate these two extremes. We want to give due justice both to our Lord's humanity and divinity in our meditations. Now, the second main signpost, if you will, or perhaps uh, signpost would be a good word, or uh, the, the second warning, uh, caution sign, if you will, on the road, 
is I think that we have a tendency to identify, we have a tendency to try to identify immediate fruit from our times of meditation. We sit down with a gospel passage, we open it up, we read, we read through it, and we say in 20 minutes when I'm, finished with, when I'm finished with meditation, I should be able to identify three things that I got out of this period of meditation. But identifying tangible fruit like that is not the main purpose of meditation. It's not the main purpose of mental prayer, which really is about growing in knowledge and love of the Lord not about picking fruit off of a tree. When we approach meditation in this way, always looking for a distinct and identifiable outcome of every single period of meditation, then we start to treat prayer sort of like a vending machine. It becomes very transactional. I'll sit here for an hour and reflect on this gospel passage if you'll give me three things that I can write in my journal or say to my spiritual director. Now, sometimes... The Lord does give us very identifiable fruit. Sometimes we are overcome with a sense of peace. Sometimes we are overcome with a sense of gratitude, a tangible sense of gratitude. Sometimes we are left with a real sense of what I need to go do, a call to action. But oftentimes, perhaps even the majority of times, as we persist in the life of meditation, there is no immediate identifiable fruit. It may be that the fruit of this particular period of meditation is seen several weeks down the road when you're able to use this particular scripture passage to help answer someone's difficult question, or when you're able to quote a verse from today's gospel to console someone who's struggling with some aspect of sin, or something along those lines. Other times, our times of meditation are not unlike conversations with family or friends. The vast majority of our conversations with family and friends, we don't remember the specifics of those conversations. But that doesn't mean that having those conversations was unimportant or uninstructive for your human relationships. And in the same way, setting aside time daily to engage the mind and the heart in reflecting on the Word of God is always formative, even if we're not able to identify in this moment the specific type of fruit. I'd like to conclude with an excerpt on that point, reflecting on just that point, from a little book that has been very in, in, instrumental in my spiritual life called Christian Proficiency, by uh, Martin Thornton. He's actually an Anglican author, but he writes very eloquently both on Lent. He wrote, writes a great book on Lent. But this book here, Christian Proficiency, is just sort of about the daily spiritual life. And when, he's, when he concludes his chapter on meditation, Thornton writes this, Simply to kneel and wait, doing nothing, if you will, is a discipline our Lord can use. It is as if, to use a markedly efficient analogy, we are God's secretary waiting outside his office door. He might ring or even open the door to speak to us, or he might not, but it is most important that we should be there at the desk. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. And plainly, this is closely linked with a daily spiritual routine, a daily spiritual rule, like I mentioned several weeks ago in my video. It's remarkable how often God chooses to speak to us when we least expect it, and terrible to contemplate how much we miss by putting feeling before regularity. And incidentally, here is the complete justification for personal rule. However bored, dull, and distracted we are in meditation, however often we look at our watch and wish the time would pass, so many minutes on our knees are never wasted. As we prepare to enter this most holy of weeks, my prayer is that you will avail yourself of the opportunity to meditate with 
an intentionality on the gospel readings and the other readings that are, pre that are uh, presented for our meditation in the various liturgies. Allow this to be an opportunity to draw you closer, to deepen your knowledge and love of the Lord, so that on the other side of Holy Week, we might be able to, to, to say to our Lord, to answer to our Lord, that we have indeed stayed and kept watch with him.